Hi guys, welcome back to my second episode recap of Quiet On Set. I got Taco Bell for this occasion. It's been such a long time since I've had, honestly, any fast food. And when I thought of the first fast food I was in the mood for, I thought, Taco Bell. I got two things of cheesy Fiesta potatoes because one is simply not enough. And it's my favorite thing on their menu. Oh my god. Mm. I also got cinnamon twists, which I actually had for the first time with Steph in Costa Rica. I was enamored. I'm obsessed with these things now, so I had to get those. I got a grilled cheese burrito because I've never had it, and like, look how cheesy it looks. Cheesy Cordita Crunch because it's one of my favorite menu items. And then I got the new, they have this like new cantina menu or something. I don't really know the details behind it, but I got the cantina chicken quesadilla, and it just looks so cheesy. Look at this. Maybe we'll get it. Oh, no cheese. No, no, no cheese pull there. I did get this delivered. Okay, let's dip it in some sour cream and some guac. Mm. That is so good. Mm. Oh, and all the cantina menus came with this like green avocado verde salsa. So let's try putting that on it. I also got some nacho cheese. I love nacho cheese. Ugh. I know I need to get to the recap, but. It's been so long since I've had Taco Bell. So the second episode begins with a woman talking about how she always wanted to be in the limelight. She wanted to do acting as a kid. But her mom worked as a legal assistant in the industry, so she knew everything about it and she did not want her kids anywhere near that. So this woman was not allowed to be an actor when she was a little kid and she kind of always resented her parents for that. Fast forward, this woman has her own kid named Brandy. Brandy, oh my, of course, we already drop a black bean. Brandy grows up watching The Amanda Show and she's obsessed with it. She wants to be on Nickelodeon so badly. So she decides to audition to be on The Amanda Show. Hey guys, so I'm editing this right now and I realize I forgot to mention that Brandy gets a role as an extra on The Amanda Show. Well, Brandy was obviously very excited about this because her dreams were coming true, essentially. And her mom was excited too because she was like, look, I get to do this thing for my kid that I always wanted for myself, but I never got. So the mom genuinely thought she was doing something good for her kid. After Brandy makes an appearance on the show, she exchanges information with Jason Handy, the PA on The Amanda Show. He kind of did that with all the kids. Being the PA, it was his job to transport the kids on set, often without their parents. So he exchanged information with Brandy and she was very excited about it because he was like, I can get you into other TV shows. So this girl thought she was like meeting people in the industry. She starts emailing with Jason Handy pretty regularly. And the mom just remembers one day Brandy shuts her computer violently and starts crying. And her mom was like, what happened? She then shows her mom a photo that Jason Handy sent her of him masturbating, saying that he sent this to her because he wanted her to know that he was thinking of her. Brandy's mom went back and forth. Should I call the police? She didn't want the police to think that she was a bad parent, so she decided not to call the police, and instead she just removed Brandy from the industry entirely. If you want... In my opinion, I definitely think she should have called the police because just because she took her kid away from it, he's still working with many other children. Like, this is not happening to just Brandy. Like, I understand her reservations, but I'm like, mm -mm. I would feel like I had a responsibility to bring this to light. Because again, if it was happening to Brandy, it was definitely happening to other kids as well. Okay, before I keep going, I kind of want to try this green avocado salsa. Let's put it on the grilled cheese burrito. Oodly-oo. 
Mmm. I got the grilled cheese burrito with black beans just because I'm not a big fan of Taco Bell's meat. I've definitely gotten sick from one of their ground beef items. So I'm like kind of traumatized from that. Mm. But this is cheesy and black beanie. I, of course, asked for fire sauce that I didn't get. I feel like whenever I get Taco Bell delivery, I always expect to not get any hot sauce packets when I ask for it just because it never happens. So then the documentary starts talking about Amanda Bynes and how at this time she's getting older. She's 16. She wants to transition to do more adult roles because she's been doing the Amanda show and all these like funny kid roles. She wants to kind of show that she's an adult in the industry. So Will Calhoun, the creator of Friends, and Dan Schneider create this show called What I Like About You, which I'm re-watching currently. It is one of my favorite shows in the entire world. Dan is constantly fighting with the producers, with Will Calhoun, about the show because he had a specific way he wanted the show to be run. And the producers just weren't agreeing with him. So they ice him out of the writer's room. He's still allowed to be like one of the producers on the show. He was just causing way too much havoc amongst the set because they weren't doing what he wanted. Um, Dan is somebody that's very used to getting what he wants. So he was not a fan of that. During this time, Amanda was actually fighting with her parents a lot. She started dating this older guy. Her parents didn't approve. And Amanda set to be emancipated from her parents, which started happening a lot at that time. A lot of child stars started getting older and they realized like they wanted to be able to work longer hours. They wanted more flexibility, which... They couldn't really get because of their parents, which is probably a good thing, right? But Amanda Bynes at that point felt like she was mature enough to not have her parents as her legal guardian. So one day she gets into a huge fight with her parents and she runs away and goes to Dan for his help. No. If I was Dan, the appropriate thing to do, since they have a working relationship, I mean, we all know it probably was more than that because he was a little bit too close to a young Amanda than he should have been. So he almost felt like it was his responsibility to help her. Or he's just a creep. But he tries to help Amanda emancipate herself from her parents. They go to trial. It fails miserably. The parents who once had a close relationship with Dan no longer like him because he tried to help Amanda get emancipated from them. So the parents make Amanda cut ties with Dan completely. He goes off of the show, What I Like About You. His only involvement is the fact that his name is in the opening credits. But he's no longer working on that show. He turns to Nickelodeon again, which Nickelodeon is excited about because Dan has had so many successful TV shows on Nickelodeon. So they hire him and he creates a reboot of all that with an entirely different cast. Still like tweens, like people that are like 12 and 13 are in this new cast. So it's still like a children's show. Now in this new adaptation of all that, Dan is kind of thinking of himself as like a god. He thinks he's so iconic because he created all these successful Nickelodeon shows. Nickelodeon invited him back and now all that has been doing very well. Watching the reboot of all that, you can just tell that Dan has this grandiose personality about himself. The cast members and episodes refer to him as a god. He was always getting these massages on set by these women working on the set of the show. Which is extremely inappropriate when you're working on a children's show, you know? One of the cast members of all that remembers having kind of like a weird relationship with Dan because 
He felt like Dan was nice to a lot of the white kids on the show, but one of the cast members, Brian Christopher Earn, remembers Dan not really being nice to him as a black man. Like, oh, not a man, he's a boy. Brian's mom kind of picked up on it very early on. There was one episode of All That where Brian was like doing some exchange of information and they kind of made it out to seem like he was like selling drugs, which the mom immediately was like, oh, so the black kid is selling drugs? Like this is stereotyping, it's just very weird. And just other weird things that happened on that show, which at the time I didn't think about this. I just was like, Okay, like this is the show. I just had no, I had no questions about it. A lot of the scenes and all that, especially in the reboot, were a very weird, uncomfortable situations. Like there was this one scene where they get like sugar poured on them and like they said that it was so much sugar that they were almost like choking on it. And it's watching it now, you're like, ew, like the fact that they made them do that, it's repulsive. He said like the sugar would congeal with their saliva and it just, bleh, it, was gross and uncomfortable and I think Dan really liked making them feel that way. He liked pushing the boundaries, which you should not be doing when you're working with children. Dan created his own fear factor basically with the cast of all that. There's a reason that fear factor is an adult show because they do obscene things to these adults. They throw them in tubs with worms, like all these gross things. It's probably something that you shouldn't be doing with kids. Like, Brian talks about how it was just really embarrassing and disturbing. This is one episode where Brian had to be covered in peanut butter, and then dogs had to lick the peanut butter off him. And watching it, it's like, bleh. I personally, I never watched that, like the their version of Fear Factor. Because it grossed me out so much. I remember they would like throw them in a tub with worms, and I'm like, that is gross. Like I just had no interest in watching that. So the fact that I was so disgusted watching that, imagine actually being in it, that's really kind of traumatic for a kid to go through. Because it's different for adults. Adults fully know what they're getting themselves into, but you just shouldn't be doing those extreme situations with children. It just doesn't, doesn't sit right. It doesn't sit right. And Brian's mom knew it was weird. Also, it's just important to note that there were just other aspects of racism that was happening on the show and nobody really said anything about it except for Brian's mom. There was this one scene where Brian was playing the youngest rapper ever and it was basically like a fetus and he had to wear like a skin tight costume. He overheard one of the people on the set say that his bodysuit should be charcoal colored. Brian says that the way he deals with race issues today has to do a lot with how he was treated on the show on Nickelodeon. While his mom was raising so many issues with this, his agent kept telling his mom, Hey, like, I know this is a little weird, just don't ruin it for him. Like, there was a lot of pickle imagery. My mom was like, is nobody seeing how weird this is? Nobody's seeing that pickles resemble a penis? Or they are, and they're just not saying anything. So when the second season of All That was started, Ryan was asked not to come back for the second season. Which at the time, really shook Brian because he was a kid and he had just made all these friends. He kind of knew his mom was uncomfortable with a lot of the stuff they were doing. He thought his mom was to blame for that, but really she was just protecting him. So Brian does not come back for the second season of all that. And his relationship with his mom kind of struggles because of that, which is really upsetting. And he says that till this day, it bothers him. He said he'll always remember that feeling, how he felt being told that he wasn't invited back. It puts a damper on your self-esteem, especially when you're so young, you know, it's just, it's messed up. I don't think any kid should be in show business. So at this point, Dan is creating another TV show, Drake and Josh, which is one of my favorite shows in the entire world. I loved Drake and Josh so much, starring Drake Bell and Josh Peck. And Dan at this point, again, had such a grandiose personality. He thought basically like he was God.
and he kind of acted like he was. Had people massaging him on set. Ew, there's like a fly in my room. Dan was also not treating the women on his set very nicely, like especially this one female editor on Drake and Josh. He would never talk to her directly, like even when he was in the same room as her. He would be like, tell her that I think this. And she was like, I'm right next to you, babe. You can tell me yourself. Um, there was even one day where she was like writhing in pain and she had to go to the hospital and he was like, who's gonna finish editing this TV show? She was like, I'll be right back. And then he gave her job away, even though he promised it to her when she came back, he gave it away to a man that was less qualified and less experienced than her. Dan, of course, denies this all. He's not even, he's not in the documentary. He just like provides statements in the documentary if you were curious. He even fired the director of all that who the kids all love. This guy Virgil was always standing up for the kids. They felt safe with him. They were comfortable going to him about stuff. They weren't comfortable going to Dan about things. Dan fired Virgil because they would go back and forth fighting. and the actors didn't feel great about it. Around the time that all that season two was happening, Jason Handy, the production assistant of The Amanda Show, was arrested for being a pedophile, basically. He had thousands, thousands of photos of little girls, and he had these different folders with the different actors, like Brandy, that was on The Amanda Show, having like letters from them. Brandy's mom gets a call and asks if she wants to testify. To which she's like, Yes, finally my chance to get some justice for what happened to my daughter. So Brandy testifies, but I believe it's like only Brandy and like another kid. Even though there were multiple folders. The other girl that decided to testify was a nine-year-old that went over to his house to play video games. And Jason started making out with her. And she felt very uncomfortable by it. And he was like, I can get you on some TV shows, like enticing her to be okay with him kissing her. Messed up. So this girl was freaked out. So she's the other one that testified. And Jason Handy only got six years, six years. Even though he admitted to raping people in his, like, journal. Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. There are people that get arrested for drug offenses that stay in jail for longer than that. We're letting somebody like that out after six years? No. Absolutely not. It's different for a pedophile. You know? You don't, like, get reformed. You're, you always are kind of a pedophile. So, and I don't know if that's problematic to say, but... I just don't trust them. Basically, Nickelodeon kind of swept everything under the rug, even though Jason Handy was the main production assistant on their shows for years. Disgusting. Four months after Jason Handy is arrested, another member of the cast and set is arrested for performing lewd sexual acts on a child cast member. We don't know who it is. The name was never revealed until the very end of this episode, which I'll get to. The man who was arrested was Brian Peck, who was a dialogue coach on a lot of Dan's shows. He even was a guest character on all that as Pickle Boy. And I think he was Pickle Boy on The Amanda Show too, which... To me, Pickle Boy was always like such a funny role. It was so random and at that time I didn't realize that like pickles were another image for like a penis. So I just thought it was like a random and funny thing. And all the cast members loved Brian Peck. The parents loved Brian Peck. They all trusted him. The parents and all the kids loving Brian Peck Brian Peck would invite them over to his house for parties and stuff because the all that cast was pretty close with him. One of the cast members, Kyle Sullivan, remembers his house being like a little taboo. He had this entire room that was basically like a Planet of the Apes shrine. It was like just a dedicated room to Planet of the Apes.
Kyle notices in the corner a painting of a clown. He asks Brian Peck, hey, what is that painting doing here? It has nothing to do with Planet of the Apes. Brian excitedly goes to get the painting. It's a painting of a birthday clown, and on the back of it, he reads a note that says, to Brian, I hope you enjoy the painting. Best wishes, your friend, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy! What the hell? This man has been pen pals with John Wayne Gacy for years. John Wayne Gacy, a pedophile serial killer, sends him this painting and he's so excited to show this child. This child! So Kyle, kind of knowing the entire story of John Wayne Gacy, I mean, he does not know the specifics, but he knows that he, like, had sex with young boys and is in prison for being a pedophile serial killer. So he's like, everyone needs to see this. Kyle tells Brian to show everyone, and Brian's like, okay! Brian invites the kids and their parents to come and see this painting, and he reads them the note, and nobody does anything?! Babe, I'm sorry. Like, I know I shouldn't be blaming the parents, but like, I'm blaming the parents. If I was somebody's mom and I saw that, I'd be like calling the cops immediately. Why are you pen pals with a pedophile serial killer? Why only a twisted person would do that? How did nobody do anything? How? <laughs> How? It makes me want to shove this off my desk because I'm so mad about it. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? fucking joking. Dan Schneider probably knew that he had this painting. If this man was so excited to show parents and their children this, oh my, I actually like, I had to pause it and like, I had to gag. John Wayne fucking Gacy, are you kidding? So a few months after this party happens, the cast of all that is all together for a table reading. And during the table read, they stop it. They have these like lawyers come in and they ask the parents at the table read to leave the room so they can talk to the kids themselves. They then tell the kids what happened with Brian Peck and that he's no longer going to be working with them. And they want to know if the kids have anything to say. The kids all look over at each other like, is somebody going to say something? Like, did this happen to anyone here? here like everyone's a little confused they also are in disbelief that it was brian peck that was arrested for this it's also very messed up that the parents were asked to leave what though i don't know the parents were not that creeped out by john Wayne gacy being pen pals with brian peck somebody that's working with their kids nobody in that room said a word and they just continued with the table read that day. And that was that. Ryan Peck was arrested on 11 charges for performing sexual acts with a child actor. The acts included very violent things like penetration with a foreign object. A lot of stuff that should never have been happening. We don't know the name. We haven't known the name for years since it happened. It is revealed at the end of this episode that the child actor was Drake Bell. I honestly started crying because there has been a lot of stuff. We'll get into this next episode, but there's been a lot of stuff going on with Drake Bell. He's had his own run-ins with the law regarding children, and it's just sad is what it is. He's kept this a secret for years, years. He never gave his name. Nobody ever knew who it was when Brian Peck was arrested. His name was never revealed, but it was Drake Bell, and he is here to tell his story, and that is going to be episode three. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode two recap. I'm sorry if I got... A little heated it's just like this is it's not it's a serious mukbang you guys there's nothing funny about this there's nothing to joke about it's disgusting aside from that this Taco Bell was simply delectable I I'm still not done I kind of got up in talking about this but these cinnamon twists have my name on it I'm going to post the third one, like, as soon as possible. Like, the third recap. Because, because I uploaded the first recap when I was on vacation, so it's been, like, a few weeks since I've seen it. I gotta catch up. I think my favorite thing that I had... Honestly, I think it might have been the case. The quesadilla was really good, but I think I really like this grilled cheese burrito. I bet if I got it like 
just when it came out, it would have been so good because it would have been like perfectly hot. I was like talking, so it got a little cold and it got delivered, but mm-hmm. Taco Bell never disappoints. Well, I love you guys. The next video you will see will be recap number three. Bye.